I'm a 20 year old female and this happened to me about a month ago. One night I was at an old school friends of mine with some other people I hadn't seen in quite a while. To be honest, I was feeling good and much better than I had in a long time. A couple of days later, my best friend and two male friends and I, only one of whom I actually knew, were going to go on a trip to Morocco. So the guy I knew well was also at that little party and after everyone had only been drinking beer and the wine was empty, he and I decided we wanted more wine. A few of us headed to a girl who only lived a few blocks away to get some more. When we got back, the guy and I downed pretty much one bottle on our own. I must note here that I hadn't had a drink for about a half a year before that, so it definitely had somewhat of an effect on me. Soon after that, everyone decided they wanted to go home. I didn't realize what time it was. One of the other guys and I could ride our bikes together for a while before he had to go straight ahead where I had to go to the left. He asked me if I was okay going on my own and I laughed and assured him yes. We separated and I had turned on some music to listen to over headphones. I took my usual route along smaller streets before taking a path along a lake. I always took this path home whenever I had been out. Along the lake is this creepy statue of a boy holding a fish in his hands, which has always given me this weird feeling. But tonight it was way more intense. The feeling didn't leave. But I quickly brushed it off for being somewhat drunk for the first time in a while and returned to the happy thoughts I had about the nice evening and the upcoming trip. Because of previous encounters and some things that happened to me in the past, I am actually scared very easily when alone and I'm not this stupid and naive. If I hadn't been a little drunk and so distracted by my thoughts, I would have acted differently. Probably not have gone along the lake at night, which I only did when I was drunk. Thinking back now, I am so thankful this happened on a night I wasn't wasted to the point I could barely talk, which was not a rare occurrence in my teens. As I was about to turn right, going away from the lake, I noticed a young-looking man sitting on the bench before the path separates. He had what seemed like a longboard beside him on the ground, and I immediately thought he was rolling a joint, the way he was positioned and staring at his hands. He was wearing a hood over his head, but I could make out a pair of glasses as they reflected the light of my bicycle as I passed him. I immediately had the feeling that something was wrong with him. I now blame my good mood and slight drunkenness for thinking about turning back and asking him if he was alright, which is why I became slower and slower as I was about to take off my headphones. I suddenly got hit by something very hard right on the back of my neck, bottom of the back of my head. Next thing I know, I'm sitting on the ground and can't see anything. The impact had caused me to go blind temporarily, and then I felt myself being ripped off the ground by my hair and I held onto them trying to ease the extreme pain in my scalp. And then I began screaming. I screamed as loud as I possibly could, as I had learned that this was the only way that most robbers and killers would get lost, out of fear of somebody coming for help. So, I'm being dragged by my hair and screaming so loud I thought my ears would bleed. I then felt someone holding their hand over my mouth, trying to get me to shut up. I didn't ever stop screaming, not even when he tried to choke me by pulling on the collar of my jacket. I remember thinking that this is the end. This is how I'm going to die. Out of nowhere, I realized that I can hurt him too. Somehow I managed to turn myself so I was facing him now, all the while he's still grabbing my hair. Then I kicked. Just anywhere, really. I kicked and kicked. I could feel the bottom of my foot colliding with something hard. As I was able to slowly see again, I made out a figure holding my bicycle above me and was preparing for the impact. Next thing I know, I was on my feet, still screaming, but by now yelling help as well, running towards a female voice. A small woman was standing not too far away and asked me what was wrong and told me to come inside with her. As she led me to a gate, I could make out a male figure on the other side and immediately started to panic, somehow thinking that that must be the same guy and they work together. But as she reassured me that was only her husband and I realized he was also much older and not so slim, I went into their house where they called the cops. 
After I had told her everything as well as I could in the state that I was in, I fell into a much worse state of total panic attack for several hours, so she had to tell the policemen what had happened. I heard them say they found a pair of broken glasses on the path, but the guy was nowhere to be seen. I had dealt with the police in my town before, and since they hadn't believed me after a friend and I had been drugged and abused a few years ago, this just made my panic worse and worse, as I thought no one would believe me now, too. My parents had to come and pick me up. I stayed in this horrible state of panic for another two hours before I could go to bed, only to fall right back into when my mother opened the window and I could feel him standing right behind me. I screamed and cried and after some time I did finally calm down. The next day my mother combed my hair and she pulled out whole strands of them. I did go on the trip with my friends, thinking it would be better than staying so close to where this all took place and being swallowed by fear. I still believe it was the better decision, but I could never stay alone with the guy I don't really know, as he was also wearing glasses and was about the same build as the scumbag who attacked me. After going to the police and making a statement, I have been told that they most likely will not find him, but they did have his DNA since they had found the glasses. So, if he ever did something like this or any kind of crime again and would be caught, he would be charged for this assault as well. I just really, really hope that I, nor any other person, never encounter this guy again. At the time of this event, I was 18, living in a large house in a wealthy area of England. It was the Easter holidays and my parents were away in France, leaving me at home to study for my upcoming exams. I had always enjoyed having the house to myself and was looking forward to being able to cook whatever, watch movies, and study in peace. I had little reason to be fearful as our house was big, modern, and separated from the local village by a very long driveway. I really enjoyed the week. I would eat instant noodles and revise during the day, go out with friends and then watch Netflix till late in the night. We'd had a lot of thunderstorms around this time and the heavy rain and wind would set off the burglary alarms, much to my annoyance. I never thought anything of it and would dismiss my alarm going off as wind, so I'd sleepily turn it off. On Saturday afternoon, a sound startled me from my revision. It sounded like something had hit one of my upstairs windows. I turned off my music and listened, thinking I must have imagined it, so I turned my music back on. Five minutes later, there was another noise coming from upstairs. It sounded like something had been knocked over. This time, I jumped up, heart thumping and racking my head for a plausible explanation, but this time one wouldn't come. I sat frozen for a minute before remembering that I could access the home CCTV imaging from the family computer. I checked the last hour and there was nothing, so I instantly relaxed and laughed at myself for being so scared. Little did I know my jumpy instincts were about to save me. I started cooking dinner. The kitchen faces a set of glass doors on the far side of the room, and it was now nighttime so the glass reflects the light of the room and attached hallway. I'm in the middle of serving up the food when I glance up to see not only my reflection, but one of a man standing in the hallway. He was short and scruffy and had something I could not make out in his hand. He was staring at me through the reflection, motionless. My body went into flight mode. I ran across the kitchen to the back door and flung myself through it, running terrified down my road. Fortunately, I had my phone on me and called the police. I didn't see the man emerge from the house as I hid behind a bush in the driveway. Everything felt like a blur as the cops checked the house. They found nothing and I started to wonder whether I just imagined it. It wasn't until an hour later that I found out the information that would haunt me for the rest of my life. The police checked the CCTV and found the footage of the man entering the house. He entered on Thursday night, two days before this incident happened. The unwanted housemate was soon found after and identified as a local homeless person. The incident was expected to be a burglary gone wrong. He was sentenced and is no longer a threat. 
However, I will never be comfortable being home alone again. Just a bit of background. Me and my sister are three years apart and I have always felt like a protective older brother to her. We've been very close throughout our lives, so what she experienced annoyed me a great deal. So this was a few years ago and our parents had recently split up and my dad had found a new girlfriend. My mom had moved out and bought her own place which left me, my sister, and my dad alone in the house. My dad has since moved out of there. I was 18 at the time, making my sister 15. Fast forward a few months to when I first met my dad's new girlfriend. She was nice, really quiet, but at the time I wasn't really bothered about forming a relationship with her. The woman wasn't the issue, however. She had two girls who, for the purposes of this story, we'll call Charlie and Rosie. Rosie was around 9 or 10 years old and Charlie was around 13. Rosie was a little hyperactive but was nice enough and quite intelligent for her age, but Rosie was never the issue. It was always Charlie. The first time I ever felt weird about Charlie was when my sister called me up one time. I was staying in my mom's house and my sister was at my dad's. My sister sounded freaked out which immediately put me on high alert. My sister was telling me that she had been spending the night with my dad girlfriend and the kids and was getting weird vibes from Charlie the entire night, and then when it came to bedtime, Charlie insisted on sleeping in my sister's room. When my sister was getting ready for bed, however, my sister caught her going through her stuff and of course told her off for it, but Charlie didn't seem ashamed or anything. Then when it was lights out, my sister heard a weird sound in the darkness coming from where Charlie was laying. My sister lay there confused and a little creeped out until Charlie got up and left the room to go to the toilet. My sister told me that Charlie's phone was on and a picture of my sister and her friend was on the screen. My sister then told me that she was pretty sure that Charlie was touching herself over the picture. At this point, me and my sister already didn't like Charlie, but what happened next makes my skin crawl. So in our old house, our bathroom had a lockable door which could be unlocked from the other side as long as you had something like a coin to turn the lock. But when we were all getting along, me and my sister must have showed the girls this. One day, we were all at my dad's and downstairs getting ready to go out for the day, and my sister had said that she was going for a shower. I was downstairs being an adult and trying my best to get to know my dad's girlfriend that I didn't even notice Charlie slip out of the room. Then about 10 minutes later, I get a call from my sister asking me to come upstairs. When I go up, my sister looks panicked, clutching a towel around her still dripping from the shower. She begins to tell me that she heard knocking on the door to the bathroom. When she stopped the shower to ask who was there, no one responded. My sister says she finished her shower and when she got out, heard running down the stairs. When she looked at the door, it had been opened. Charlie had been watching my sister shower. This absolutely sickened me and still does, but I can't even imagine how my sister felt. Thankfully, my dad and his girlfriend broke up and we've never had to see Charlie and Rosie again, and that's probably the way we'd like to keep it. A few months ago, I started working the breakfast shift. This means that every time I work this shift, I'm the only person in the department for a minimum of an hour, so there's no one to interfere with or debunk what I'm experiencing, and the only way into the rest of the hospital is through a door that is locked from my side, and the person that comes in after me opens that door when they get in. Aside from the usual unexplained noises here and there, distorted sense of time and sometimes reality, Items moving from one end of the kitchen to the other or disappearing altogether just to appear elsewhere, there is something that happens almost every time I work. To explain this, I need to give a small bit of background. The door from the outside opens right into a locker room, and within that locker room is a door that leads to a storage room. There is only one key to the storage room. This detail will be important later. 
Every morning, I use the key to open the storage room, and when I do, the keys get stuck in the lock. This never happened when I unlocked the door while I was training for the position with a co-worker. When the key gets stuck, the lockers on the other side of the room begin to rattle, and I am stuck wrestling with the key for several minutes until eventually it relents. This happens every morning without fail. However, when one of my co-workers came in this morning, they went to go into the storage room, only for it to be locked. This door does not lock from the inside, and I still had the key from when I unlocked it two hours earlier. When I unlocked the door for the second time, it did not get stuck, I'm assuming because I was not alone. Another thing that happened this morning, I had to bake off pre-proportioned scones that were marked but frozen together. I used my key to gently bang them against the table in an effort to separate them. This made a very rhythmic bang sound that rang through the kitchen with a distinct pattern. I turned to put the box back in the freezer when the very heavy steel door that was completely open before swung shut behind me. It took some muscle to get the door open again, but that could have been the result of me not having been caffeinated and it was 4.30 in the morning so I could have been weak. When I broke free, the exact same pattern of banging sounds that I had been making to break apart the scones sounded like it was coming from the other end of the kitchen about 70 feet away. I called out, thinking maybe the bread delivery had come early and walked over when I received no response and no one was there. I am not the only person who has experiences like this and I was actually brief before working on an open shift alone to things I may experience by someone who is very serious and a religious person who has been working there for over 30 years. Bearing in mind his warning and experiences he has shared with me, I believe something may be taunting me as my experiences have been more apparent and confrontational. Am I overreacting, or should I be worried? Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, I worked as a maintenance custodial individual for a school and a church. They were located on the same campus with the chapel, offices, kitchen, and multi-purpose room for dinners, events, etc. This was also a brand new school and the building connected to the school with an area which one set of steps to the gym and another set of steps downstairs which was the cafeteria for the school. The cafeteria had a kitchen and outside the cafeteria was a hallway which went around as there were doorways to other rooms, locker rooms, bathrooms, and another stairway that had a pop machine next to it which led upstairs. This will be important to the story a little bit later. As you went up the stairs on the other side there was an area outside of the gym, a foyer one way, led outside and the other to a ramp leading to the school. Both entryways to the gym had lockable gates to secure specific portions of the building. I was working second shift at the school and sometimes the shift went into midnight and beyond. It wasn't uncommon for teachers to come in and out throughout my shift no matter how late to get their prep done for the following school day. One evening, I was coming off the elevator into the main hallway to take out my trash which was bookended with doors which led to a stairwell on each side as well as doors to the outside. As I stepped off the elevator, I heard the outside door of the stairwell close. I went to take my trash out from the hall door to the stairwell and to the door which led outside. I was in the stairwell and heard someone running up the stairs. I didn't think too much of it because, like I stated earlier, this was not uncommon for teachers to come in late. It wasn't until I got outside and dumped my trash bag into the dumpster that I realized the stairwell light had been off and that there were no cars in the parking lot. Immediately, I got chills and my skin reacted with goosebumps. It did cross my mind that maybe someone got dropped off, but thought that that would be a strange thing for someone to do at midnight. I went inside and searched the four-floor building inside and out and no one was in the building. My heart had been beating hard the entire time and I was truly creeped out the rest of my shift and that unsettling feeling followed me home. 
Fast forward two weeks later and I was doing my nightly rounds of checking doors, gates, making sure everything was secure before I left for the night. This particular night I was downstairs by the cafeteria and ready to go upstairs on the other side when I heard the cafeteria's kitchen door slam. Now, I know it was the kitchen door because when you work at a place long enough you tend to know the sounds everything makes. I froze in my tracks and got chills. I said hello and didn't hear anything but also didn't want to stick around long enough as the events of two weeks before were still somewhat fresh in my head. I was pretty scared at that moment, ran upstairs, locked the other gate, and ended my night. This story happened when I was 17 years old. It was 2 a.m. during a 4th of July. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling thirsty, so I decided to go to the kitchen and get a glass of water. But before I did, my room was pretty dark, so you could barely see anything. I was too lazy to turn the lights on, so I walked in the dark instead. I go into the kitchen. When I turn the lights on, I see my sister standing there facing the window. I was a bit confused. I mean... Why would anyone just stand there staring at the window in the middle of the night? Unless something was going on, but there was no sign of anything really going on. At first I laughed about it, but then I got annoyed by it, so I told my sister. Hey. Hello. Dasha. Dude. Dude. Dude, answer me, man. Stop being weird. Go to sleep, we have to wake up early in the morning and help out with the flood, it's freaking 2.30am or something right now, go to sleep. Still wasn't getting any response. Uh, look, whatever man, I, I don't want to hear you complaining in the morning about not getting enough sleep. I got my glass of water, went upstairs to the, my room, shut the door and went back to bed. I forgot to mention, my sister and I share rooms and we have our own separate beds, so when I heard my sister's bed move, my eyes were wide open. When I slowly turned around to see my sister sleeping in her bed this whole time, it got me to the point of panic. I said whispering, What the? How? If I l literally saw her in the kitchen like a minute ago? I didn't want to wake my sister up and tell her because she's a very paranoid person and gets scared really fast. Later that morning at around 11am, me and my sister were up helping my mom cook and decorate the backyard. I thought of telling my sister right there at that moment what had happened earlier that night, but like I mentioned, my sister gets paranoid and pretty scared quickly, so I decided not to tell her and just ignore it. Later that evening, my sister and I were playing games on the PlayStation in the living room. My mom came and told us that they were going to start lighting up the fireworks. Since I love watching them, I asked my sister, Hey, do you want to come with me outside and watch? Nah, you can go. I still want to keep playing. So, I ended up going. An hour passed, it got dark, we were still lighting up fireworks until I got a feeling of someone watching me. I looked across the street to see my sister standing there looking at me, and I turned around to see if anyone else had saw her, but right after I turned back to look at her, she wasn't there anymore. Me, I began to freak out. I ran back into the house to see my sister still playing on the PlayStation. I was so freaked out and frustrated, so I had no other reason but to tell my sister. I asked to speak with her urgently. I took her to the room and said, Look, I don't want to creep you out or anything, but earlier today, in, in the morning, around 2 a.m., I thought I had saw you in the kitchen, just standing there, staring outside the window. I kept calling you and calling you, but you weren't responding back. I went to get a glass of water, and when I went back to the room, I heard your bed move. I turned around to see you sleeping there, even though I just saw you like seconds ago, in the kitchen, and I saw you again outside across the street. I'm really scared. 
Ashley? I... Yeah? The exact same thing happened to me. Instead, this time, I saw another you. I had the fastest heartbeat ever. My blood felt so cold running through my body. Uh, are you... Are you, are you kidding me? Because I'm... I'm being serious. Dude, I'm not messing with you. I'm serious too. I didn't want to tell you because I didn't want to scare you, but the other night I was up and when I looked outside the window, I thought I had seen you, but you were sleeping right next to me the whole time. I knew then right away it couldn't be anything other than one of those doppelgangers. What? A doppelganger. Someone who looks very identical to you. After that conversation with my sister, I haven't felt the same. Especially what happened that night after the 4th of July. I pulled an all-nighter, but everyone in my social media was asleep, so I gave up and went to bed. I like my windows open during the summer since it gets really hot, but still didn't feel safe having the window open, so I got up to close it. My heart was beating so fast when I look outside the window. I saw my sister's doppelganger standing outside, and right next to her was mine, both directly staring at me through the window. It's been over a year now since it happened. I really do hope to never see them in my life again. I was born, baptized, and raised in the very common lifestyle in my area, the Evangelical Church. The Church classifies themselves as non-denominational Christians, which implies that they are of their own identified branch. You see, most of what this Church really is all about is only something you pick up on if you grew up as a skeptic. Thank God I grew up always asking questions about different things, God being one of them. My dad told me the most important thing was my personal relationship with God and to take most of what I heard and apply it how I can. My childhood was mostly innocent until I was 10, and I'm going to go into how my friend's church was before going into my home church. Now her church was on the extreme end of the spectrum of the evangelical religion. Their Sunday school classes were filled with worship that was sometimes a rock concert and other times they were more lyrical and had the kids do dances to the music. I wasn't a fan of either of these worship surfaces because, one, the rock concerts were too loud, and two, the dance moves didn't make me feel closer to God and we looked silly and unhappy. We were told to obey your mom and dad, or God will be disappointed in you. You must do everything your parents want to do, even if it's wrong. From a very young age, I was fed messages of, if you don't do this, something bad will happen to you. And if you do this, you are a sinner and weak in the eyes of God. My strength was put to the test at the age of nine when my mother went crazy, kidnapped me, and showed me what being homeless and on drugs looked like. She never showed me the drugs, but she did partake. When my dad rescued me a year later, the people in his church rejoiced and welcomed me in with open arms. This church saved my dad after the divorce of my parents, and he saw saving me from my mother was an act of the church's faithfulness to God. God brought me back, not the police who came looking for the missing girl my mom kidnapped as well. With that said, I grew up as a skeptic of organized religions. In my teenage years, I had asked a lot of questions about God's intentions. I asked why God gave my mother mental illnesses, and I was told to pray about it by the congregation. And sometimes God just gives people hard cards to see if they can handle spreading his word by my dad. My pastor told me I couldn't read Harry Potter because the spells they used were real. Yes, that was a real thing, and I missed out on a huge chunk of growing up in the 2000s because of it. I can't enjoy the series and it makes me sad. I read the first four anyway until I got caught and was told to never read them again because it was a sin. Speaking of sin, do you all remember purity rings? Well, the purity culture is real too. 
If you want to prove your worth and commitment to God, then you must wear a purity ring and pledge not to have sex before marriage. I wore one until I lost my virginity, pre-marriage. It felt so good to throw that thing into the lake. Purity culture was a way of showing girls to be submissive, committed, and would die for their husband by being pure for their wedding night. We were fed lies about birth control, condoms, and sex in general. We were told that what we learned in health class was a lie and to only listen to what they had to say. They told us that it would be painful if it was before marriage because God knows what the young woman is about to do. If the child of any parent in the inner circle disobeyed God in any way, they must repent to the pastor and be prayed over by the congregation in order to be saved. The inner circle is a group of individuals in the following rank. Pastor, youth pastor, greeters, people who greet, mingle, and introduce newcomers to the church. Youth leaders, pastor's close friends, and Sunday school teachers. Everyone else are sheep. The ranks are unspoken and throughout my teenage years my parents were just on the cusp of being part of the inner circle. But since I was a rowdy teenager and sinned left and right, they were unable to be fully a part of it. I was fed lies that I was being a bad girl so that I would stop experiencing mental illnesses that I could not control. I used to self-harm because the pain felt good, but my parents told me I was just searching for attention. My eating disorder was said to be a demon possessing my body. That's a story for another day. I want to warn you about the church because all four square churches are a part of this. They say they're non-denominational, but it's a cover for something more sinister. They brainwash their congregation into being perfect citizens or God will make their life miserable. If any of you believe that, it's not true. God loves those who love Him, and He is a loving, forgiving God. If you sin, He will forgive. He gets that we're human. He made us. If you believe in God, just remember that and I promise you'll be safe. For those of you who might be wondering, I am a very spiritual person, however, I take pieces from all religions and apply them to my life. I do not despise the evangelical church nor Christianity in general. I am simply writing this as a warning to stay away from these deceptive people because they don't even realize they are deceiving you. The part I feel is the scariest part of all. So this story happened to me and my friend, we'll call her Anna, about seven months ago. In the town we live in, there's a popular bridge with train tracks underneath it where a lot of us will go smoke, drink, or just hang out. It was the summer, going into my senior year, and Anna and I were bored one Saturday night, as there isn't much to do where I live, so we decided to just go hang out at the bridge. Now the way the bridge is set up, there are two ways to get in. The first way is you have to turn down a side street and park off to the side of the road on this small strip of gravel. Then you walk down the street a little way and then go behind the guardrails and down a steep slope of dirt and rocks to get to the tracks. You have to cross the train tracks and go to the side of where the bridge is to climb up the rocks. The second way to get in is through the other side. You just hop down off the street into a short trail that leads you down there. You don't have to cross the tracks or anything to get there. Anyways, Anna and I get to the bridge and by now it's about 10.30 to 11pm so it's pretty dark out. We didn't really think much about it as we lived in a nice town and nothing really bad ever happened where we lived. So we hopped out of the car, turned on our flashlights from our phones and started to make our way down the slope, trying not to fall as we laughed and shouted a bit. We finally get down and climb up the rocks to get to where the couches and small fire pit were. I sat down against one of the pillars on one of the folding chairs while Anna sat on the couch. We were just talking, hitting our vape pens and nothing was out of place. After about 20 minutes or so I started to hear small noises like something or someone moving around in the woods behind or more like next to the tracks. I then had the strongest feeling that we were being watched. I kept looking behind me trying to see if I could see anyone but it was no use. It was so dark that I couldn't see my own hand in front of me. 
I think that she started to get the same feeling that I had as we both just made eye contact and gave each other that I feel it too look. Anna then asked me what are you doing and tried to put my arm down. I told her to be quiet as I shone my flashlight in the direction I thought we were being watched from. She started to quietly panic and I told her to act calm. We tried to just tell ourselves that we were being paranoid. The flashlight didn't shine that far and we couldn't see anyone in the area that the light did cover. The noises started happening more frequently which made us panic even more. We started to discuss the situation. If there was someone there, where would they be hiding? How long had they been there? Were there more than one of them? Anna then got the stupid idea to shout, Hello, is anyone there? We're chill, you don't have to hide. We sat in silence for five minutes as nothing happened and the noises stopped. It was dead silent. Then all of a sudden, an empty plastic water bottle was thrown in our direction. We could see where it landed only a few feet from us, and we were scared absolutely out of our minds. Now we knew that someone had been there watching us. Anna said we needed to get out of there, but we were both too scared to move. Afraid that if we did, whoever was there would come out and attack us as we tried to climb down the rocks. We heard a twig snap and I nearly screamed. Anna decided that she was going to jump off the edge of the ledge we were sitting on. I grabbed her arm and said it's too high to jump off of. You can't even see all the way down to where the tracks are and made her stay with me. By now, we had been there for at least 45 minutes to an hour. Had he just been there watching us the whole time? We calmed down and decided that when we count to three, we were going to run across the rocks and book it across the tracks and back up the slope to the car. I counted. One, two, three. When I said it, we ran as fast as we could, not looking back to see who was there. We made it back up the hill completely out of breath. We decided to walk over the bridge and see if we could hear anything. We stood on the bridge above the opposite side where we had been sitting before. We called down shouting, who's there, you better leave now, and a bunch of other things and a few obscenities that I won't repeat on here. We heard a scuffling and rocks moving directly under us. When we were running across earlier, he must have tried to chase us and when we made it to the top, he just went to the other side of the tracks and climbed up those rocks. There was no way that he had been there the whole time as he had thrown a water bottle at us earlier and it would have been too far to throw it from the other side and it came from a completely different direction. We got really freaked out and started to leave and then heard a train coming. I grabbed my friend's arm and said, wait, if we wait for the train maybe we can see who was watching us. She agreed and we slowly and cautiously walked back down to the slope as the train began to approach. The train lights were so bright and at first we couldn't see anyone. Then I looked over to the pillars and to my absolute horror, I see someone wearing a white and purple beanie with the blankest eyes I had ever seen peek around one of the pillars. He looked strung out and like he was on something. He saw me immediately and ducked back behind the pillar. I screamed as me and my friend turned to sprint back up to our car before the train passed so he couldn't follow us. We booked it out of there and have been back at night ever since. I still get freaked out that he had been watching us the whole time we were down there, and if he did manage to get us while we were running, what would he have done? I don't know, and I certainly don't want to find out. Before I type this, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of an idea to what the layout of my house is. I live in England. My bedroom is on the second floor right beside my parents' bedroom. As you come out of my room, the stairs to the landing and hallway are just in front. On the first floor, you have four rooms, but the only ones that are important is the kitchen and the living room, which are beside each other. The thing about our kitchen, though, is that at the end of our kitchen, we have a door that leads into another few rooms which was probably meant to be a self-contained flat or apartment. 
And then in here, we have a door that leads to the back garden. The garden is basically a little fenced in wooded area, and my window points towards the garden. As I'm typing this, it happened about 15 minutes ago. I woke up at about 2.30am to my cat knocking something over in my room and climbing out of my window. I saw eyes. I definitely saw something. I left my curtains open and my window slightly open too. I was really annoyed since our cat is typically a house cat and isn't allowed out during the night. So I go to my window and try to call him back in, but I can't see him anywhere. At this point, I'm thinking he's probably jumped down to my patio just under my window is a bit of the roof and was quite high up, but I couldn't see my cat, so it was the only option that he had jumped down to my patio. At this point, I throw a jumper on and slippers and have my phone in hand with the flashlight turned on. I go into the kitchen, but as I get to the room that leads into the back garden, I close the door that goes to the kitchen. I walked to the back door, opened it, and pointed my flashlight around, but I couldn't see anything, so I left the door open and walked out a few steps to see if I could find the cat. Keep in mind, to get to the door behind me, you would have to go right in my line of sight. When I couldn't see anything, I decided the best course of action would be to wake my parents up and tell them what's going on. So I walked back inside the house, shutting and locking the door behind me, then going to the kitchen and locking that door too. I walked out of the kitchen and into the living room where I was going to try and work out how to tell my parents that my cat decided to go out the window at 2am. But when I turned the light on, sitting on the sofa, was my cat. I definitely saw something leave from my room, but if it wasn't my cat, what was it? This happened when I was a senior in high school. It was around 8.30am when I decided to walk to school. There were two ways I could walk, but I decided to take the shortcut with the dead end. I know this was stupid, but I had walked there before millions of times and it was the broad daylight. As I was walking through the dead end, I am halfway walking and I see a white car slowing down. I thought it was weird because there's literally nothing there so I assumed they were lost. Then I see one guy get out of the car and walks behind me. I already had a weird feeling in my gut so I started to pick up the pace. That's when another guy gets out and walks on the opposite side of the street. I quickly panic and they start walking as fast as me. I notice the white car starting to get closer and closer. Both the guys in the car were saying something like maybe a plan. My grandma lives behind the dead end block and my only option was to run. I don't know why I didn't decide to call the cops. I guess I just decided to go with flight. As soon as I started running, both of the men started running to catch up with me, and I was unable to cross the street, and that's when some woman drove up to me and asked if I needed some help, or if she could drive me anywhere. She told me that those guys were following me and that it's not safe for me to be alone. In my head, I thought that she could be part of the plan or something trying to lure me in. I got in her car anyway, thinking I knew I couldn't outrun them, and... I didn't want them to know where my grandparents lived, so I asked her to drive me to school. Long story short, they followed us for a bit and then decided to leave. I was so scared but so grateful that that woman decided to save my life. Who knows what would happen. I wish I had gotten her number down or something so I could be able to take her out. She told me she sensed something was wrong when she saw me running frantically and said she had a niece in the same school as me and would want someone to do the same for her. She told me never to walk the streets alone and show me more compassion than my mother ever did. I am forever grateful to her. A year ago I moved into a commune house, a Vonheim. All seemed quite nice on my floor, just two people were behaving quite strange. As time passed, one of them, Jack, made unsensible statements. He already has a three-year-old child that lives in Hungary with his girlfriend. He's in Germany for three years. He talks a lot about sexy girls and what he wants to do to them. 
He walks around half naked a lot, even when it's pretty cold, and gave me strange, hungry stares besides compliments. You notice quickly that Jack doesn't have respect for women. The conversation that angers me till now is, you can only love one person. If a couple gets a child, the man only loves the woman, and the woman only loves the child. That to give you a picture of his character. Then for one semester, he studied in Uganda, and the owner rented the room to a 40-year-old woman from China named Lin. But Jack came back a month too early, and then the strange behavior got worse. He broke into the empty room next to me to sleep there. He was passive-aggressive a lot and pressured Lin to take in his stuff. He knocked at her door at inappropriate times just to say goodnight or to get through his stuff slowly without taking anything out of his luggage. One night in the morning at 6 a.m., I needed to visit a friend in another city. I noticed the commotion in front of her room. Lynn walked in her evening robe nervously up and down the corridor. I invited her for some minutes into my room. She teared up while telling me how scared she is of Jack, maybe taking her stuff or hurting her. Lynn also was getting pressured because Jack said that he would be extremely disappointed by his good friend if she puts his stuff out. The truth is they don't actually know each other. They met at a three-day prayer and barely talked. So I said she shouldn't fear anything and I would support her. So she wrote in on our floor's WhatsApp group that she wants the stuff out. After Jack was trying his don't make me sad number, I jumped in writing that she is doing the right thing. Then Jack's tone changed immediately. He threatened, telling me to shut my mouth, and apparently knocked on my door while I was at a friend's place. My boyfriend opened the door. When I came home, he was in shock, telling me how scary Jack was, ranting about how he came and said that he could make me disappear. My boyfriend said that he needs to tell me a story that had me locking my door properly every night now. Apparently Jack bragged about taking me to a place called Gala. Jack and his friends were used to going out. One of them would try to seduce a girl. He would bring her home, bandage her eyes, and another person would have their way with her without her knowing it. For two weeks now, not only Jack would behave strangely, even Lynn started being different. She only saw sides. Whoever didn't agree was an enemy and she developed a paranoia. Lynn eventually moved out. Since then, she stalked one other girl who stays on the floor, who was a former friend of hers. Lynn even stood in front of her window watching this former friend. She didn't want to do anything else out of fear. Jack still lives here. He's still passive-aggressive and tries to get me kicked out of the building and insults me in the group me. I'm just scared of what he's capable of. Both Lynn and Jack gave me the creeps, and I don't know if I have the money to leave. So I have short term memory loss issues which can be annoying to say the least. Admittedly there has been times where it bordered on dangerous. Just now I was just driving through the back road that runs through the woods dividing my best friend's house and mine. It's one I've driven about a million times as we've been friends for years. Most nights I find the drive rather relaxing. The occasional deer, moose, or even bear might startle me along the way, but that's something I've grown used to. After all, these woods are practically in my backyard. I was maybe a mile into my drive home when suddenly, in what felt like a blink of an eye, I was flooded with absolute dread. I don't remember why. It was as if though I had woken up from a nightmare. And even though the memory was gone in an instant, something about it still lingered, and the feeling of sickening panic had yet to fade away. I'm home now, and even still I feel creeped out. Clearly my body remembers something I don't. I don't scare easily. I'm a witch and an avid horror fanatic. At any given time, you can find me delving into something that gives the average person the creeps. Scary is kind of my thing. At least, scary is usually my thing. Right now, I do anything to get this paranoia to subside. I've locked my doors and windows and gone all out in terms of paranormal protection. 
but it's hard to know how to protect yourself when you can't remember what you're so scared of. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I'm so stuffed with fluff. I'm dummy thick. <laughs>